In the Gun, episode number 43, live from Indianapolis at the Combine. Well, at least half of the show here today on episode 43. Wesley Euler, Jed Drenning, the signal caller. Our dear Owen Schmidt is in Disney World. Yes, the happiest place on earth with his family. So he's got the week off. I'm in Indy. <laughs> Big O's in Disney. Jed in West Virginia. What's going on, partner? How we doing? We got it all covered. Yeah. We, we thought our base is covered. Uh, we thought Big O had another incident with his phone and it ended up in a fishing pond because it was one street to voicemail <laughs> until we tracked him down in the world's happiest place, right? So that's right. Good for him. Uh yeah, we said take her easy. Take two in a row. It's that time of year. We'll back that's off. Right. We, we he's trying to line up some interviews. We're leaning in pretty hard on him for that stuff anyway. That's some good. former teammates. So uh he's earning his keep. He is certainly earning his keep. Uh, this episode of ITG brought to you in part by Bet Online. Bet Online remains your number one source for all of your sports betting needs this season. Everything from football to basketball to esports. You'll always find the latest odds, team matchup information, player news, and game trends at Bet Online. Bet Online features live betting, free contests, and live scores for almost any sport or game you can imagine. It's the fastest and easiest way to bet all your favorite leagues and events. So head to betonline.ag to join and receive your five percent welcome bonus with your first deposit make sure to use the promo code believe when you sign up to receive your rewards that's b-l-e-a-v at bet online where the game starts jed headlines here to get us going as always and if you're watching on youtube right behind me here now i said in the past right lucas oil stadium this is my fifth year at the combine i swear four straight years the past four years i've had the same hotel room and lucas oil stadium is right out my window I don't know what the Steelers did this year. I'm on the exact other side of the hall. I don't know if that room was taken, if they didn't book it, whatever. I'm on the exact other side of the hallway. But this right here behind me that you see me pointing to, like I'm a weatherman, is the NCAA headquarters. Yes, the axis of evil. That's where it's based out of, right there behind me. It's actually a beautiful facility. There's a whole river promenade behind it. Indy's a beautiful city. I poked around there yesterday. It's really cool. Now, Jed, they had a big, huge, you can't see it because the angle of my hotel room, but it's right around the corner here. Big, huge American flag flying, right? Old glory right up in front of the NCAA headquarters. And I was wondering if it needed to be at half mast because, I mean, it was it was certainly the end of an era with Mark Emmert and uh, the beginning of a new one here for the NCAA. Yeah, well, first of all, we can't decide if it's promenade or promenade. All right. That's true. It's a good point. I guess it that, depends on what part of the country you're from. There you go. Right? <laughs> That's like Coke and soda, right? That's right. So, and then you got, you know, it's interesting to see the American flag, old glory, flying outside the institution that Brian Bosworth referred to as the National Communist Against Athletes, right? But you're there for history. You are. Out goes Mark Emmert. In comes new President Baker. No relation to Wren, just as Wren said. But he's an interesting guy. Uh, he really is. When you look at this this new cat that's going to be in charge and spearheading the efforts on the NCA side to to fix what ails them in these crazy times, uh, he he ran an insurance company for the longest time, okay. then got into politics. Uh, strangely enough, and I think you heard Ren make mention of this, he's a highly popular Republican governor in Massachusetts. That's a neat trick. It is a really neat trick to pull that off. So. That that's like that's like being a highly popular Democrat in Texas, right? <laughs> that's, that's exactly right. So when you look at the task before him, I think he recognizes in reading his comments, that's the thing that stands out to me. He recognizes how immense the challenges are going to be when he I say Charlie, I mean, Charlie Baker, the new president. And he also recognizes that you can't do it the old way. The NCA is how it's going to be. They were a very reactionary uh, you know, group or organization that moved at, at the speed of a molasses drip in January. He re he recognizes now they're going to have to be far more nimble to address all these pressing needs that are coming. And at, at every turn, there's a new one, right? So oh, it's, a, it's a crucial moment in the future of the NCAA. Like, there's it really no is. doubt about that. There's, there's, there's multiple lawsuits going through litigation. You have an antitrust suit against the NCAA. You have a couple, you know, actions that athletes uh you know might be ending up with the rights of employees so that there, there's that debate so there's a lot to chew on stepping right into things for charlie baker uh but when, when you look at the, the the story that that was reported by espn and others picked it up they're, they're talking about the legal threats and the nil issues 
or among the top things that he's going to be stepping right into. And I, I do think I keep using the word recognize because that's the first thing you have to ask yourself. Does this guy appreciate what he's stepping into? Does he see it? Can you tell by what he's saying that he truly does recognize it? And he, he does. I think he appreciates the, the vast differences between the smaller, small budget division three schools. And he talked about the, the power five schools. Okay and uh, the power five schools and a number of athletes that on some level have to be treated differently. Now they're talking about putting different thresholds in place to, to perhaps treat those schools differently. Maybe those thresholds would involve attendance, but th there's a bunch of different ways you could look at this and break this down, but it, it, it's going to be really interesting. But basically the story of Charlie Baker taking over at the NCAA is, is the story of college football or, or, or college athletics at large right now and all the issues that are converging, right? So that's, it's, that's where we're at with it. Which direction does he go first? We'll see. Pivotal moment, crossroads moment for the NCAA. You're right. For, forever, they dug their feet into the sand and refused to change. And now all of a sudden overnight, I mean, they've, they don't just have to pivot from that. They've got to do a complete 180. I mean, they've got to be on the front they foot. They've got to be on the front foot. So you good had, luck to – you you had, I'll close with this on this topic, Wes. You had legal action. To some extent, we've talked about this here on the podcast before. Legal action with the Board of Regents case back in the early 1980s and 1984. And, and by a lot of respects, the NCAA felt that the court ruled in their favor. And they also felt that on some level, the court was deferring to them in terms right. of how amateur athleticism would, would look moving forward. So that's why they kind of sat on their hands. And for the better part of the next 30 plus years, when they had opportunities to do something, I'll offer some sort of olive, olive branch to the athletes. They meet, did, meet them they halfway. Did yeah. They did nothing. And so they they felt or they acted like they felt ambushed by that nine nothing decision that went against them. When in fact, maybe they shouldn't have been. They should have Jed, seen Jed Stevie you know? Wonder could have seen that one coming. Yeah, you had so many chances to do something. Here we go. Anyway. Well, all the best to uh, Charlie Baker, because this this could be a moment that we look back on 10, 20, 30 years and for better or for worse, could say the NCAA was was never the same. Um, I'm an indie big O's in Florida, yeah. wherever you're going, make sure you're signing up for your go Mart rewards. This episode of ITG. Did you like that one, Jed? That was pretty good I there. Uh, I, mean, I tell you, I tell you what, this episode of ITG also brought to you by our friends at go Mart. Make sure you're signing up for your go Mart rewards. Uh, the big story here, though, in Indianapolis this week, Jed, is not the changing of the guard at the NCAA. It's the uh, odd timing, the surprising story, um, the arrest warrant issued for Jalen Carter. For those who aren't familiar, a defensive lineman from Georgia, a back-to-back -back national champion who was projected as a potential number one overall pick, certainly a top five guy. Yeah. I think, you know, if the Bears would have stayed, if the Bears end up staying at one and they're not going to take a quarterback, all of a sudden he's got a great chance or maybe had a great chance because he was scheduled to go to the podium and right at about 1030, uh, I forget what the exact county police department is in Georgia, but yeah. he was he was charged with a few misdemeanors, oh, I would imagine, but... re reckless driving and a few other misdemeanors in relation to, if you'll recall, there was a death after Georgia won the national championship game where a player and a trainer. A couple, yeah. Again, this is all allegedly, right? So I got to do the Pat McAfee allegedly thing here. But essentially, they were driving home racing from a party after, you know, a national championship celebration party. And there was an accident and the two people in one car died. Well, Jalen Carter was allegedly driving the other car. So there was, you know, an investigation, a warrant issued for his arrest. Moments before he was supposed to take the podium at the combine and speak, Jed, am I being too cynical with the time? I mean, is it too cynical to think uh, that's that's uh, that's interesting timing for that that indictment to come down? It's it's crazy timing. Let's let's start with this, Wes. Jalen Carter's don't grow on trees. You kind no, of they do them. not. He was he was a main cog in what Georgia did defensively the last couple of years. He's he's a one he's a true one gap penetrator. That that skill set is coveted at any level, especially at the NFL level. Uh, so he, he's a unique uh, he's a unique player that brings unique talents and unique yes. abilities. And as you touched on, perhaps one overall, certainly top five. It's it's the season of misinformation in the NFL. 
that's what they always talk about this time leading up to the draft. Don't trust anything you hear and half of what you see because everybody's trying to jockey ahead of one another, maybe use misinformation and weaponize it to try and find a way to force this or force that, or you, you gain leverage on a team and force a trade or you force them to go a direction they otherwise might not go. So if you ask yourself, I, again, I don't think I'm being a conspiracy theorist. I don't think you are either. The timing is strange. This happened, as I understand it, maybe a couple months ago, and it just surfaces. It was it was a it was a few it. days after the national championship game. There you I go. Believe. So, so like mid January. There you. It's it's been a while. So, and it surfaces as you talk about, you know, right with the 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 brightest spotlight shining upon him to impact his future. So you're asking, okay, well, who would sabotage that? Who would sabotage him in such a critical time? But I, if I had to pick, I go back to what I started with. It's the season of misinformation. I would imagine there's X amount of teams sitting behind that number one mm. pick that wouldn't at all mind giving him that fall, number one him falling pick. outside of the top ten. Yeah, there you go, or or even outside of the top five. Who knows? Right, if they right. Fall to six, maybe somebody trades from twelve. I don't know what happens. I just know that you you can't trust just about anything this time of year at that absolutely level. Abs- so absolutely that i i don't know i mean it's it's a horrible tragedy you heard kirby smart you know he uh he gave a release regarding this and anybody that's ever been around a tragedy around a program like this which unfortunately i have as well uh it, it's just it, as dark and terrible as you think it'd be and this just kind of shines a spotlight on it two months after the One, fact. It, it, re, it rehashes it all over That's right. again, right? It, yeah. It's, it's a terrible situation, but you can't help but wonder. The timing is profoundly suspect. Maybe it's a coincidence. That's strange. And I'll give him, I'll give Jalen Carter credit for this. You know, I think everyone he got whisked out of here, obviously, and you know, he had to appear back back in Atlanta. Yeah. Um, he was back here today. Back at the combine today, meeting with teams, answering their questions. So whatever happens, I think there's at least credence to that of, you know, he didn't bolt out of here and run and hide. He he went back to Georgia, came right back here and is, you know, sitting down with teams and looking owners and GMs and coaches in the face and telling him, you know, telling them their his side of the story. So and I'm sure the decision was twofold. It was ultimately his decision to make, but he was also most likely advised to do that uh, by those helping him out in his camp, right? Uh, but it, it, it's it's a tragic situation. But here's the inter- interesting part as well. Nothing gets by or few things get by NFL securities. Right. I mean, you have some of the best retired cops, some of the best retired oh. federal agents working for these teams, doing background checks. So this makes sense only in so far. And as you said, we don't know the details of this. You don't want to rush to judgment. But for the better part of the last couple months, we've heard whispers of character issues surrounding Jalen Carter. And you couldn't make any sense out of it because there was no narrative to attack. Do you agree, Wes? I mean, you, you heard Absolutely. that. And you're like, I haven't heard this kid doing anything. I mean, wh- what are you talking about? He doesn't seem an off, like an off-the-field problem. But we've heard that. It's, it's not the first time. Now this happens, so here we go. But unfortunately. Hey, what? Cert- certainly, it's very early, but it feels like that story is going to dominate the draft process here for the next six weeks. So uh, you won't be hearing the last of, of what's going on with Jalen Carter. I think that that's safe to say. This Great. episode of ITG, ITG 43, that rolls off the tongue nicely. Also brought to you by our friends at Toothman Ford. Make sure you're checking them out. Great inventory online for you to uh, see everything there before you get to Grafton. And you got to get to Grafton because we all know cars cost less in Grafton. Speaking of somebody who's been to Grafton and knows all about the great deals at Toothman Ford, it is time to talk about our guy, Dante Stills. And this works out well, Jed. You know, most of the time we record on Wednesdays, but this worked out well that we're waiting until Thursday because we now have Dante's results. Um, Dante has gone through his yes. workouts, his drills, his everything at the combine. We're going to hear. Yes, I uh, should have worn my Toothman shirt because here, speaking of Grafton, Dante and Letty and I, with Frank Gore and some former NFL guys, worked Toothman's, J.R. Toothman's camp. In Grafton, at the Grafton High School field last summer, summer before last, Ooh. but but Dante was there and it was great. But rolling on, you it. mentioned Grafton. I had to mention that. I love it. No, that's awesome. Uh, so we got some numbers here from Dante. We're gonna hear. I was I was able to get to his availability uh, at the podium. You'll see. I mean, I'm standing right there in, in front of Dante. You'll hear me ask a question or two along with some other people. 
Um, we're going to play that for you here in just a few minutes, but we got to go over some of these these numbers first here, Jed, yep. and discuss uh, 4.8540 for Dante, which is, I, I think, exactly where he wanted to be. And what's even better, though, is his 10-yard split, which for that position, defensive tackle, that's what matters. How often is a defensive tackle running 40 yards, right? Only if he's turning around and chasing a running back going past him. 1.72 for Dante, which was the fourth fastest of all the defensive linemen. I think he he not only measured well, but I think that speed and that burst still showed up. When you combine the way he ran today with what with his weight as well, too, I think it was a very good day for Dante. They're looking, uh, just as in any high-level football, they're looking for burst and explosiveness. And that's what those numbers speak to. When you talk about a 1-7 in, in that particular drill, that speaks to a high level of explosiveness. And, and again, just like we talked about with Carter, what's coveted by NFL coaches and NFL scouts is the ability to fire through one gap and create problems and be a disruptor. And the more explosive you are, right out of a two-point, right out of a three-point, the more explosive you are, the more productive you can be at that. And I, I think when you tie it into the game tape, Wes, this is probably the best game tape that Dante has had in his career in one particular key category, and that's tenacity, consistency. There have been times in the past, sure, he's had his flashes. Sure, he was productive, but not week in, week out. The thing about Dante this year, is outside of very few exceptions, he showed up and he performed. Now, that doesn't always translate to production. I mean, that's the thing about that position. That doesn't always mean you're going to have two or three TFLs. That doesn't always mean you're going to have a sack or two. Oh, Sometimes no. you're making the sacrifice within the scheme to allow a teammate, either someone else in the D-line or a second-level player from, from a backer position to come downhill. But he was more consistent and tenacious this year, starting with the pit game all the way out to Stillwater than he has been at any point in his career. So when you look at what he did today, I'm sure he interviewed well. Anybody that's ever been around Dante can tell you, he, it, 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 he's a very personable guy, okay? Mm -hmm. He's a very real dude. So you sit down with him for a few minutes, you're going to walk away thinking, right. what I see is what I get. So he's going to win the interview in that respect. Uh, but when you look at the testing and look at the numbers, they're going to say, hey, we like it at his size with his skill set, and that matches what we're seeing on tape. So all this kind of comes together, and I think he he really served himself well. He certainly did. And like I said, I mentioned those measurements because you'll notice this a lot, right? If you're a football-savvy person or you're a geek like Jed and I and you pay attention to these things, a lot of times guys will come in at a higher weight, right, than, the, than what they play at to try, and, to try and look better on paper, and they won't run. And then they go to their pro day and suddenly they lost 20 pounds and they want to run, right? That's right. Dante, Dante didn't do that and he still ran a great time. So six, three and a half is his official listed height by the NFL now, 286 pounds. I think when you combine those measurables, Jed, again, with him him having the measurables that that he needed to in terms of his size and being able to still show the speed and the explosiveness with that. Like I said, what really matters, if you look at his his uh, his 40 time, he's pretty high up there too. But fourth best 10-yard split, that's the explosion that you want from a defensive tackle. Um, it's funny, you know, I one of the guys that I work with is Max Starks. I know you know that name. Uh, anyone who is a, a Steelers fan would know that name, or if you're just maybe a football junkie, you remember Max. But he played college football at, at Florida. Um, and then and then won two Super Bowls with the Steelers. Now he works with us, and he covers college a different college football game every week for ESPN Radio. Like he's yep. he's insane. He'll be in Dallas doing the Big Twelve Championship game on a Saturday, and then he's in Sun he's in Atlanta with us on Sunday calling the Steelers game. He he is just a football junkie. Played the sport his whole life. Now calls two games a week, sometimes three. At the beginning of the week. He, I was asking him about Dante, and, and he was like, I, I really like him. I like his versatility. I think you can deploy him in a lot of – like he's not a guy who needs That's to go to the it. perfect – he's not a guy who needs to go to the perfect scheme. He's like – he's like – he's like I would – he's like I would rush for a, a third-day draft pick for that guy. Today, after his, his stuff came out, Max was like, I tell you what. He's like, I don't know. He's like, I think there's going to be a lot of teams hoping that he's still available in the fifth round. So – We'll, yeah. we'll we'll see. And again, like you know, this time of year, it's always smoke and mirrors, and you can never put too much stock into what you hear. Um, but I think, again, you all know, while I've been here at the Combine since Monday, it's Thursday night as Jed and I record this. So I've been in Indy for four days. 
Um, I have been poking and prodding and asking about Bonte everywhere I go and everyone I talk to. And like I said, so far, so good. When you look at his production against the run, when you look at his production as a pass rusher throughout the course of his career, when you look at his skill set, his body type, his length, what appeals to you, again, at the next level, he could be a first and 10 run stopper. He could be a second and nine pass rusher. And he's starting to build a pretty compelling case, make a pretty compelling case. We're not just talking about the consistency of a 12-game season and what he brought to bear for the football team in Morgantown over those 12 games. We raved about him, as did others. He's already seen postseason action against high-level competition in another pro-type setting at the East-West Shrine Bowl, right? At that all-star game, he shined all week in indie drills. He had one-on-ones against very high level, some of the most talented kids in the country that are prospects themselves. He ate their lunch. So now you have the 12 games on tape. You have the consistency, the overarching consistency and production of a long career, but more specifically the 12 games followed by the cherry on top, which was the East West. East West That's another thing. A lot of people mentioned how impressive he was there. Now some numbers in this setting. So he's really starting to make a case for himself. And I think that's what Max was talking about. When you, when you look at guys, you ask yourself, okay, well, he could be an edge rusher in an even front scheme, or he could be an interior tackle in, or an edge rusher in an odd front scheme, an off-ball edge rusher. I, right. Just in general, I'm not talking about Dante. I'm saying that's the type of things you ask yourself about a body type or a defender. Right. Or he could be an interior you know, penetrator in an even front. Well, Does Dante, he need to play in a 4-3? Yeah. There you go. Dante has that skill set that, you know what, not only can he be disruptive from the interior – but even in a pinch, he can kind of be a swing man off the edge. Like I said, I don't think there's going to be a D coordinator scared to send him off the edge against the tackle in a second down passing situation. So he gives you some flexibility from a defense defensive standpoint. And with limited roster size at the NFL, like they have, he, I, I really think that he's heading in the right direction with this. And each of these settings uh, puts him in a better position than he was before it, starting with the, his senior season, starting with going into the East West Shrine Bowl and now Indy. So mm-hmm. here you go. Uh, it's exciting. It absolutely is. And we still got Bryce Ford Wheaton to come. Uh, yep. Bryce, yep. Bryce will be uh, media on Friday. So I'm hoping to I'm hoping to be able to nab some some Bryce audio as well, too, for us, some video and audio as well, too. Uh, and then Bryce will be on the field on Saturday. Um, they want the the reason for that is they want the quarterbacks throwing in prime time on Saturday. You know, that's their big made for TV event. So, of course, the quarterbacks need wide receivers to throw the ball, too. So uh, yeah. so that's the so, herd. So Saturday night, hopefully after we're all celebrating a Mountaineer uh, basketball win against Kansas State, you can you can chuck on the NFL Network and uh, and watch Bryce uh, get some. By the some way, Wes, we bronze. talked about this. The environment for that game Saturday, real quick, is supposed to be off the charts intense. Like I mean, secondary ticket sales are, are more than the Kentucky oh, game a few years ago, right? Which is wild. Insane. I mean, it's, it's I'm awesome. glad the fans are recognizing the relative value of this group and what's happening down the stretch and what potentially is at stake. I mean, I found myself geeking out again. I'm not a basketball guy. I say that first, second, third. Yeah, but you're a mountaineer, baby. I'm just, that's right. I'm just a fan. I I found myself before the Iowa state win. I was like, all right, how many teams have gotten in as an ALB and at large bid, not a conference champ, obviously with 16 wins. How many teams have done that? Do we have enough at 16? That seems like a long shot. It's happened seven times of 16 wins. So then I asked myself, when's the last time? Georgia 2001. So I went back and looked at their resume. Of course, I'm very biased. And I thought that doesn't stack up to what we've done this year. But here's the shortcoming. Now we're at 17 wins. Great. I I think if you're the committee, the one thing that might hold you back, and this would be, as I understand it, groundbreaking or historical, but I'm no basketball Mm -hmm. expert, six conference wins, irrespective. Of the toughness of the conference, I can't, I, I can't think of a team as an at-large that got in with six conference wins. I, right? I think it's happened in the Big Twelve once. As it was six, I okay. think one time. But but you're absolutely right there. Uh, my answer to that would be the rest of the bubble is way worse. Now they might have a better conference record, but if you look at the, you know, I'm doing air quotes, the, the bubble. Yeah, 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 yeah. Go, you know, go go look at. Other than Texas Tech and Oklahoma State, the other Big 12 teams that are on the bubble, go look at Creighton's resume. Go look at Utah State's resume. Go look at Pitt and UNC's resume. It's nowhere close to WVU's. It's not. And so you're right. I think that six is enough to make you feel like it's not a lock to get in. 
but you yeah. take care of it. You take care of business on Saturday. You beat another ranked team. You oh, get to that I, seven think, number. It's it's I, it's I a wrap. Say, I I feel that if you win Saturday, you don't just take a pen, the head of a pen, and prick the bubble and burst it, right? I mean, you're taking both hands and smacking you can, you them can, together. You can write West Virginia University <laughs> yes. in yes. pen on yes. your 68 teams. I you mean, can write it you, down in ink. You, you jump from this weird conversation right now that we're having, bubble or no bubble, and I, I kind of feel like we're getting it. But again, I'm no expert, like <laughs> we're getting it. You go from that, how often, Wes, do you jump from that to all of a sudden worried about seating? It's almost like we skipped two or three steps in the middle weird, there. It's like It's a weird we're, dynamic. Yeah, we're, we're going to go from bubble – to all right, well, yeah, come on, and we're going to be upset about what seed we are. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> That's what it is. It's a funny anyway. dynamic. It is a Here funny dynamic. But let's go Mountaineers. Let's get it done on Sunday. Let's go Bryce. Let's get it done on Sunday. Uh, before we hear from Dante here in just a moment, wanted to give a shout out to our good friends at Fortis for roof performance and financial security guaranteed. Make sure you're visiting Fortis.us. Dot com. All right, Jed, we ready here. We ready to see and hear from our guy Dante Stills. Careful. Here is uh here is what he had to say at the podium at the NFL 2023 Scouting Combine. What did you hear maybe from the Falcons coaching staff throughout the week about how you played and maybe what do you think you can take this? Um that I had great energy going through the um the whole week. Um, you know, I was, I was very locked into a whole week because you know there's, there's a lot of guys that, that were there that I didn't go up against, so I wanted to prove that I was able to to, uh, to, to beat those guys out. So yeah, I, I got a lot of I, I got a lot, a lot of good feedback from the coaches, and I really love my energy. Sure. A lot of the East offensive linemen said that you were like the top guy that they faced all week. How do you feel like maybe what you did at West Virginia prepared you for that kind of environment? Um, I had great coaching staff um, that prepared me throughout the whole the whole season and eight years before that. Um, a, a, a great um, a coach, uh, a strength staff, um, a coach Mike Joseph, um, really um, just from my whole body and mindset um, throughout the years at West Virginia. So I, I give all the credit to them and uh, all, all hard work my teammates and stuff like that. So. Yeah. Yes, uh, San Francisco. At the Shrine Bowl, just, you know, what was it that was really cooking for you and that we could practice? And uh, what did you like about playing in that system? Yeah. Um, I wanted to prove that I, that I was the best out there. Um, you know, I feel like you know I'm confident in myself to say that. Um, you know, so you know I'm very versatile. I, I, I wanted to show that you know I, I can play all across the board. Um, and, 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 and we just put on a good show. That's that's kind of the whole point point of that. So I just wanted to do that. That was my next question. Was just when you meet with teams, do they see you as more of like a three technique? Like where do they kind of? see you playing um, at the next level. You know, at three technique, five technique, um, like, like I said, you know, I told them that, you know, I can play anywhere in the run game, pass game. So, you know, I try to be more of a versatile as possible because, like, you know, I feel like it limits you playing one position. So, you know, I, I try to be great, at, you know, at all five. So. Last one, uh, just do you have a signature move or a move that you lean on the most to kind of set up the rest of your Um, It's really just, like, off reaction. So, like, I really don't have a certain move. You know, I like, I like the double swap. I like the, 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 the chop grip, uh, long arm, and stuff like that. So anything I can do to get past the, the lineman in front of me, I'm going to do it. So, for sure. Um, I, I, I think I definitely did well. Um, you know, like I said, like, I, I wanted to go there and, and, and prove myself to those guys that I'm able to um, compete against anybody in the country. Um, you know, um, and say, like, I, I was only playing against um, a couple of ACC teams, and I only played probably one, a couple of SEC teams, so like mostly Big 12. So, so like, there's a lot of talent that I didn't see there that, that I played against during the season. So, you know, I, I said like I wanted to go there and prove that, you know, I, I, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm the best one there. So, when you meet with the NFL teams, the staff, what do you want them to know about you as a person? That, you know, I, I, I'm a great teammate. You know, I get along with everybody. You know, I love to learn. I, I love feedback. You know, it, it's, it's, I feel like the base thing. You know, I, I, I love to learn. You know, I don't care. I, I don't care if you're a guy that you know, a younger guy to me. If, if you see something that I need to improve on, I'll take that advice. Um, and really just like just embrace all this. Um, uh, show them that you know I'm I'm definitely able to be a draft pick um, and, and definitely a, a guy that they can trust. 
on and off the field, so stuff like that. Well, what's, what's up with your family? I looked at the family tree and there's plenty of experience yeah. in the NFL. What's that like? Um, it's definitely great. Um, you know, my, my dad played 10 years in the NFL. Um, um, my brother, he, he played uh, he played a little bit. He, he got injured a little bit, but he, he will be back. Trust me. Um, but yeah, like just, just having that guidance, you know, is really just like the, the biggest thing. Um, I, I got a lot of vices these last you know, few months, and especially the last couple of years. So it, it's definitely been a blessing to me. Um, so yeah, really. What was the best advice? Stay in your lane and and, and and work. That's kind of the biggest thing, you know. Focus on you. Focus on your craft. Uh, focus on your mindset, and because like cause right now, you know, it's, it's kind of all mental. Like you know, this is a mental thing. So you know, I keep my mind sharp. You know, I keep my mind at peace and stuff like that. What was that? Uh, yes. You mentioned how you love you learning. What was the biggest lesson that you learned in your time at West Virginia? You mentioned how you love learning about the game. What was the biggest lesson that you learned in your time at West Virginia? I learned a lot. Um, it was really patience. That's kind of the biggest thing throughout the rest of this whole process and, and, and this like the season because like. I'm never gonna be perfect at this game. Ain't nobody gonna be perfect. So, you know, just to, to, you know, just put your head down and working every day. That's kind of the biggest goal for me. You know, I say I had great coaches, great teammates that helped me throughout the season, throughout my whole career. So, you know, listening to them um, and all the advice they gave me, you know, it's, it's definitely a blessing for sure. Dante, what are some things that teams are asking you the most about in your interviews? Uh, probably like where I want to play, versatility, uh, versatility wise, um, and really just like you know. Asking me just like family and stuff like that, where, where I'm from, and you know, home life and stuff like that. Have you gotten to speak with the Patriots yet? Uh, yeah, a little bit. Yes. Sir. How, yeah. how'd that go? Describe it. It's good. Um, you know, just asking you know basic questions. You know, just like you know, where I say where I'm from. You know, position and like weight, height, and stuff like that for sure. Yeah, is there a team that obviously prizes versatility, guys? You can kind of play yeah. up and down. Yeah, I, I, I pride that too because, like I say, you know, I, I don't want to be limited to one spot. You know, I, I, I want to be able to play across the board. So. Any old, any old no, I have not. Dante, speaking of where you're from, Fairmont, West Virginia. Yeah. I know so it can be hard to reflect at this moment, right? But from Fairmont to the to the podium here, like when you think about that, what's Fairmont mean to you? It means everything. You know, I have lifelong friends there. You know, obviously that I went through to school and this life with um, my family's there. You know, it's 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 just. A place where I just call home. It's, it's, my, it's my home, you know. I feel so, most no, comfortable there. Um, I love everybody there. I endless support, uh, you know, and just like you know, I feel like you know, I'm just, I'm just blessed. You know, I'm just very thankful to be from their small town. That you know, I, I, I'm glad I'm able to represent them and you know, my family in the state for sure. Speaking of growing up, wow, what was your high school experience like? Did you play any other sports? Were you involved in any yeah. clubs or anything like yeah, that? Yeah, I played basketball. Play basketball in high school. How would you say? Would you say that that experience helped develop your athleticism? Yeah, for sure. You know, I, I definitely play basketball. You know, obviously, like stay in shape, uh, cardio. Like that's kind of the big thing for me. Like I, I always want to stay in some type of shape. Then plus, like I, I went to a, 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 two state titles with them. Um, pretty much my whole team was basketball players. I was kind of like one of the only ones strictly on football. So you know, I definitely enjoyed it. You know, it was a great time. I had great memories with, with coaches and my, my friends. So yeah, it was, it was definitely a blessing. Sure. Jed, I don't, if you love WVU, if you love West Virginia, if you love, Don, I don't know how that doesn't put a smile on your face. You see the smile and the excitement on his face. I mean, he's just, and that's why, he gets a ton of different questions there in those seven-ish minutes. I mean, the guys from New England, the reporter, there's a reporter from the Patriots there who just asks, you know, goes, hey, have you met with the Patriots yet? You know, there's someone from the Titans. Hey, have you, if someone from Tennessee there, hey, have you met from the, met with the Titans yet? So there's some vague stuff like that. But you hear him talking about what WVU football meant to him, what it was like playing with his brother. And that's when I had to jump in. Uh, that's when you can hear me the loudest there and ask him just, you come from Fairmont, West Virginia, which – Hey, listen, I've got family from Fairmont. I'm not poo-pooing Fairmont. It's not Texas. It's not Florida, right? It's 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 not a it's not a football hotbed traditionally. Um you, you come from Fairmont, West Virginia to this point now, standing on the stage at the NFL Combine. You know, what's Fairmont mean to you? And you hear him talk about his buddies and his coaches and how that'll always be home and he's got lifelong friends and relationships there. 
I just, I'm 32 years old and I do this for a living. And I, and I walked away from that, just beaming, just like so happy. Yeah. Like, man, I love this guy. I hope it works out for him. I hope he lands in the right spot. I hope he gets drafted higher than we all expect. Cause Dante yeah. rule Dante just rules. That's the only he way does. to put it. He's the yeah, best. He does. And it, it almost felt during points of that interview, the only thing he was lacking was a miner's helmet and a pepperoni roll in his hand. Right. That's right. That's but, right. Uh, you know, big week for the stills family at large. Congratulations to Darius, right? Big week for Darius. That's right. So uh, exciting times for them. Big news for his family. Uh, but yeah, Dante is going to take care of business. And, and the other part of this is I, I'm privy to a lot of conversations that take place during critical times at halftime, right? Adjustments, scheme discussions, things like that. And some of the conversations that take place with Dante and that position group and the assistants taking care of them they're technically pretty well coached and Dante's part of that. He almost became a kid that was helping coach the others. So once again, you mentioned the Patriots, that's the kind of thing that staff, that's exactly the kind of thing that appeals to that staff. So when you sit down mm -hmm. in these more individual type settings and have one-on-ones with these teams and you start talking scheme, he's going to hold his own. And then some that really matters too. Ab so it absolutely a question mark there. He'll check that box very readily. That's going to matter too. So good for him. Uh, great interview and good for you for jabbing a couple comments in there and getting some good Fairmont stories out of it. I had to, and I was proud of myself to see that one. That was one of the the, the clips that the the WV football used on their social media accounts was 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 me asking him about Fairmont. So I'm doing my part out there, Jed. I'm doing your part. I'm I'm, I'm, I'm doing, I'm doing my part. Um, but yeah, you know, just just great stuff from Dante beaming there. You got to love it. Um, him talking about West Virginia, him talking about the program, him talking about his brother. Uh, I, I know you appreciated the shout out he gave to Mike Joseph. I literally was thinking to myself, I know Jed's going to love this when he shouted out Mike Joseph there as well, too. Um, I was having a Mike Joseph conversation with somebody today. Yeah, because yep, I listen, there's there's not bigger Mike Joseph, not many bigger Mike Joseph fans in the world than Jed Drenning. So no, I knew you would like that. Somebody asked me, they said, when's spring when spring ball started? Somebody asked, well, what is spring ball? Somebody from out of the state asked me, have you started spring ball? I said, no, 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 it's still Mike Joseph season. It's still Mike Joseph season, yeah. baby. Spring tell tell Punxsutawney yeah. Phil to cool it. It's still That's Mike right. Joseph. Yeah. It's still right. Mike yeah. Joseph season. Yeah. Um, but man, like I said, don't think this week could have gone much better for Dante. Let's let's hope for the same for Bryce Ford Wheaton starting on Friday as his media and his interviews. And then again, on the field on Saturday. Um, but, but it's, it's been yeah. a lot of fun here. I got to meet clay, the WVU football video guy who was here yeah. as well too, it's went it. up and I said, Hey, you know, Jed Drenning and Sean Mariner, those are my buddies. <laughs> and uh, and so yeah. it's, 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 it was a lot of fun here this week uh, at the combine. Um, and Hey, we'll, we'll uh, hopefully continue to do this in the future. We got, yeah. we've got to have Mountaineers here every year and maybe next year I'll be on the Lucas oil side again and we can have a different backdrop. It's pretty but, remarkable. It, you know, Wes, since the season ended, you know, you and I and, and Owen have talked about this. We've had at some point right after the college football national championship, they come out with the way too early top 25, right? So we had full intentions of discussing that like the week after the national championship, and that was going to be the content driving the show. But it's the very nature of college football and Mountaineer sports that we haven't had a chance. <laughs> Each week it's supplanted by something more timely. Right. Right. Some story breaks, and we find, hey, we got plenty of content. That's right. We'll get to the preseason of the right. way too early talk. It might not be as early by the time we get to it, but we'll get to it. It's we'll evergreen. We'll talk about the Big 12 teams in it, but but we and we haven't even gotten into the off-season guests that we want to line up and bring on board. And so there's always something to talk about, and there's always plenty of chatters. It, it, it's been this has been we knew we'd have content during the season, too much to even deal with. And we wondered what's the off-season gonna be like. Well, this is our first time dealing with it. And we haven't really had a chance to unfasten the seatbelt yet. It's, it's been pretty remarkable. It is. It's been fun. We dig yeah. it. And let's, let's, yeah. let's hope it continues that way. Yeah. Um, thanks. Thanks again to, uh, to bet online, go Mart, Toothman Ford and Fortis for presenting this episode of ITG. Uh, everybody enjoy your weekend and let's, let's have ourselves a Saturday. Let's go beat Kansas state and pop that bubble. Like Jed said, like and uh, let's, let's hope that Bryce Ford Wheaton shows what we know that he can do on the football field as well, too. As always, the last thing that we ask of you, the only thing we ask of you is to be an ear and tell an ear about your new favorite WVU football podcast for dread Drenning. I'm Wesley Euler. Enjoy the weekend, everybody. And we'll talk to you soon. You've been in the gun.